Uh, okay, so I'm just going to go over a little bit of the next work stuff. These are pending things. They're not in any particular order other than uh, the order that we wrote them in. So one thing that came up recently, or a few months ago now, was with, with the availability of the 32-bit arithmetic instructions, we have, for things like inline assembly, we have the constraints, right? And right now, the only one that is there is the R, which is for registers. Um, and we talked about this in office hours maybe back in January. Um, put a little closer? Okay, sorry. Um, but basically the question is, are we still happy with these semantics and should we move forward with implementing them where if you use the register constraint, you're going to get a warning for things that are shorter than the bitness of the register. If you, if you have a support for the 32-bit operands, then, and you pass in something that is not a 64-bit value using the R constraint, where the R constraint says use a 64-bit register, do we want to warn about that? Do we want to say, to silently you know, expand whatever is passed in into a 64-bit register or what? And so the R one is the one that exists right now, and then we had talked about two more for W. This is specifically a 32-bit mode register for using the sub-register, basically. And uh, capital R, which is always a 64-bit. Um, similarly, for instruction immediates, th using basically things to specify as constraints for the operands in your inline assembly, that these are the right bittiness, bitness, basically, and warn with them, warn if they're not. So get a warning if you said, use a register that is 32 bits, and then you try to stuff a 64-bit value in. I mean, probably you want the compiler to tell you about that. So. I don't know if there's been any, if anybody remembers this discussion or if there's been sort of growth on this topic, but if we're happy with this, we can just go ahead and implement these additional register constraints that you can use in inline assembly. Um, any objection from Clang side? I think this is what we agreed last time, right? Yeah. And I think you can just go ahead the implementation and uh, we will do the same in the client side. Okay. Yeah, great. Well, that's easy. Uh, the next thing is what I think we're going to be hearing more about shortly, but basically the BPF memory model. Um, apparently from the compiler side, there's probably not much we're going to have to do with this, but in terms of once we have a formalized, like, this is the BPF memory model, this is what we do, we need to make sure that the compiler follows that, and if there's any compiler implementation in terms of uh, if there's new built-ins that are needed or emitting memory barriers so that loads and stores aren't reordered, just to ensure that we don't that we maintain the memory model, basically. Um, probably this isn't going to take much in terms of compiler implementation. This is more like documenting what the BPF memory model is, and Paul's got great information on that, so I can kind of pass up over this. Uh, maybe go to, I mean, it's on the list. <laughs> we haven't done it yet, but it's coming. And now the stuff that is a little bit more relevant, I think. Um, one thing that came up a lot in the self-tests is the BTF information that GCC was generating was huge. And the reason it was huge is because the self-tests include vmlinux.h. And internally in GCC, basically, to emit the BTF information, we were translating from Dwarf with no additional pruning or anything, which means you get type information for all of the types that are in vmlinux.h or whatever kernel headers you're including, even if you're not using 90% of the types that are there in your program. Um, and so people, you know, obviously, if you compile some short self-test that because it included vmlinux.h, it has now 7,800 types in it for like a five-line program. And so uh, we wanted to get rid of that, and we ended up talking in the office hours a few months ago. Also, the difference is that Clang, when it's generating the BTF, it's always limiting to only what's actually used by the program. And so really you have these two different modes of operation in terms of there's BTF for BPF programs, which you want the minimal amount that you can. You care about representing what's in the program. And then on the other side of things, when you generate BTF for the kernel, it's translated from dwarf, so you're translating all of the types. And so having those two modes of operations be available is useful. And we decided basically to um, add the option in GCC, similar to what Clang does, to basically do pruning when you emit the BTF. And so this is, well, I sent the patches up last week because GCC 14 was branched, so I had to delay a little bit, but these are basically 
this will be what's an in upstream in, in GCC in terms of prune BTF by default for BPF programs so that when you do BPF GCC minus G, you get BTF with core support that's pruned, basically just what you would want for the default. And if you want it, there is a no prune BTF option to turn that off and basically allow you to generate the full BTF regardless of whether all the types are immediately needed by the program or not. And so the, qu the question here basically is, the pruning mode is the one that is useful for BPF programs most of the time. We had discussed that there may be some utility in keeping around the old option, which is why we did. So I don't know, is, is there any plan to sort of implement the same as the no prune option in Clang? No. No? You just don't see any use for it? Yeah. We already used for several years as a no request to add this option. I think we just keep it this way. OK. So all right. Um, this, is pro this is something that I don't think you have to worry about in Clang. But because of the way that the debug formats work in GCC, um, basically BTF is available for any target, not just for BPF, which means you could build some x86 program, emit BTF information, and try to do LTO or something. And that becomes a problem because for BTF, which you're representing only the types and variables that are actually in the program. So if you have some variable in your program that gets completely removed by optimizations, then you need to be very careful about what you do with the BTF for that, right? So we would say you don't want to have BTF claiming there is this variable that was in the source code that got completely optimized away because BTF isn't like other debug formats in that sense where Dwarf would say, you know, you want to know what was there at the source level. In BTF, we say we want to know what's there in the resulting object. And so we run into this problem in GCC because in order to support LTO for things like Dwarf, the debug generation is split between this early finish and late finish mode. And basically, this is something that we in GCC have to deal with. And uh, yeah, I mean, the use case here would be if in the future we decide rather than generating Dwarf for the kernel and then translating all of that Dwarf into BTF, in theory, you could just have the compiler generate that BTF immediately, keeping things like pahole in the loop to make the amendments that it does. But now instead of taking dwarf, translate it all to BTF, and then add more to that BTF, you just take the BTF from the compiler and add in the new stuff, and it's simple. Um, so that's, that's a potential use, use for this. And that would be where the, the no prune option comes into play, because you want to have all of the type information available. The next thing, these are just some simple to-dos, but basically the ability to be able to dump BTF information easily. This is something, you know, if you use obj dump, you can dump dwarf information. You should be able to do the same for BTF. There's not really anything preventing that. And for also, this, this relates to, you know, if you're going to be doing other things with, with the BTF capability, like compiling your kernel with generating the BTF immediately, then you need to be able to merge and duplicate BTF, different BTF sections from different objects at link time. And again, in theory, there's nothing preventing the new LD from doing this. It's just not supported yet because the majority use cases for the individual BPF self-tests where you don't need to worry about it. Um, but yeah, so this, this is what I was referring to before in terms of when you build the kernel, you build dwarf, and then you translate it, right? Um, but that means that you have this sort of hidden requirement here that anything that you can express in BTF, you must also be able to express in Dwarf. And as we see in some cases from things like the type tags and decal tags, that isn't always something that people want to have, right? Like, we want tags in Dwarf, but maybe some maintainers don't want their compiler to support that. Or they don't, they don't like the idea of, pass, of bloating up Dwarf with these tag things that are mostly useful for BTF. Um, so this is, in a way, it's, it's a gratuitous sort of coupling between Dwarf and BTF that it just comes from the requirement that you generate Dwarf first and then translate it into BTF rather than going directly. So the question here? So just out of curiosity, has anybody, <clears throat> have you spoken to somebody who actually doesn't want to add tags to Dwarf? Because I would- Yeah, the GCC maintainers. 
<laughs> but that's like a very small footprint, isn't it? There's not that many types that are using tags in, in the kernel. Right? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> well, sure, okay, so. That, I mean, th we're just getting to the next point here, right? Which is, we still don't have the type and declaration tags in GCC. And the reason is basically upstream objection to the dwarf format. And we've addressed all of those concerns and said, you know, we, we can't, you know, their, their main concerns are basically, you're gonna bloat up dwarf, and because of the way that the tags reference each other, you can't always share the dies for the tags. And that's gonna cause more bloat, and we don't want that. So the big pushback has been, we don't want your, your BTF tag things in our dwarf. But for GCC, we, we, ha we basically have to go through dwarf for BTF because of how it's internally implemented. It's kind of funny to me that the dwarf people are, com are complaining about bloat, but okay. Yeah, but, um, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it's okay. Yeah, there's just, there's just not that many tags. I mean, we, we, we right. will add more. There's like, you, like yeah. we have like the user tag and RCU and there's many things, but I think if you, So it's not it's not just adding a new a new tag ID or something. I mean, this is a sort of a disruptive thing because you are basically inserting a new sort of element in the in the type dice in type dice links. And Dorf is designed in a way that it's almost impossible to extend it uh, without breaking backwards compatibility. And it is so. I think that's the reason why people sort of object to that kind of things. It's if you implement the type tags in, as they should be, as they should be, then yeah. any dwarf reader that doesn't know how to deal with type tags will just not be able to deal with your dwarf. So we had to resort to this thing that we designed also with uh, Edward Singerman and other people and John Hong and other people, you know, and it's, it's a little bit ugly, but and that's why people, yeah. but the GCC maintainers, they had some particular objections. But I think that we have good answers for all those objections. Yeah. But we have not pursued this uh, anymore in the last few months because we were too busy like trying to build the, the self-test. So now we will have again some time to actually give it another try. But basic, basically we know that we need the tags and that's pretty much my next priority after LSFMM. So it's gonna be to restart that conversation and push for it. Uh, we can probably skip that in the interest of time. So, so a uh, quick, quick question. Yeah. So, I'm going back to the previous. So, do you like if you imagine dwarf uh, BTF directly? Do you have to like pass through the dwarf? Yes, internally. Um, so, a few years ago in GCC, it was decided that the debug, the way that the debug formats are generated, would be dwarf is the canonical debug thing, and other debug formats are translated from that, and. The problem is that. That's slightly different. So, so in GCC, you don't have like internal debug representation. Like the GCC internals are dwarf always. It's internal dwarf. Yeah. It's it's ugly. It's an implementation detail that is unfortunately blocking our progress right now. I mean. In terms of what it encodes, but yeah, that's the that's the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, do you want to cover the last topics, too? Jose? What? You want to cover the last? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you wrote these ones. So. Okay. So this is the last part, which is only a little, a few additional points. Um, Okay, so the first one, the first, the first of them is this one, is maintenance model of the compiler, the support in B, of BPF in the compiler itself. Why? Because we want to take the verifiability seriously since the beginning, right? And that is a luxury that we understand that the Clang port did not have because that's the disadvantage of going first, right? I mean, you find all the problems first, and then the advantage of being second is that you can actually learn from lessons you know, and actually you know, in advance, you know what the possible problems there may be. So, um, 
we suspect, we don't know for sure, but we want to think carefully about whether the existing maintenance procedures and models of compilers like GCC, or Clank for that matter, actually are work well in practice with the requirements of a verified target like BPF. Why? Because there are some things that to, seems to us that are fundamentally different. For example, in normal targets, so in not verified targets, um, new optimizations, they don't break legal pro programs, or they should not be breaking legal programs, right? But that's something that is not the case for BPF. For BPF, the introduction of a new optimization, it may break the ver verifiable Ability, yes, the verifiability of some existing C program, BPF program. Um, but even bug fixes in the compiler may cause this, because a bug fix can result in uh, a slightly different internal representation of some piece of code that gets optimized in a different way and therefore may lead to not verifiable output. So it seems to us, and this is brainstorming, I mean, it seems to us that the typical development model, like, okay, there is GCC 14, and GCC 14.1 gets released, then it gets branched, then there is the maintenance branch, and then you have the master branch in GCC that gets all the new functionality, and only bug fixes get backported to the maintenance branch, and then GCC 14.2, 3, 4, and so on gets released at, big fax, at bug fix releases, and then at some point in a year, GCC 15 will be released. Now, does it actually work well in practice for the BPF requirements? Because, and that, for that I need your feedback, because for us, I can imagine, if I have a big set of BPF programs, that they happen to be to build into verifiable BPF today for this particular version of GCC. Let's say 14.1. Um, if in five months or in three months 14.2 gets released, which is a bug fix release, is it safe for me to actually upgrade to 14.2? Because I would like to, because it fixes bugs in the compiler, but it could make my programs to become not verifiable even from bug fixes. I don't know how real this problem is in practice or not. So let me go to the conclusion, then we can discuss. So we are considering, actually, introducing in GCC upstream a, a special maintenance branch for, the BP, for BPF, in which we basically, uh, we carefully apply bug fixes, but only those bug fixes that in the self-test, for example, or in, in other, uh, I don't know, some sort of testing, uh, are not likely to break a verifiability of the output, right? So users could actually get 14, po instead of getting 14.2 or 14.3, they could get something like, I don't know, 14.2 BPF or 14. This is just brainstorming. I mean, but we are actually starting thinking about this kind of, those kind of considerations. So what do you think about it? How real is this problem in practice? I know some people, they, they have their own forks of Clank, right? By necessity. So. Yeah, so <clears throat> in our experience, uh, <clears throat> the way CI and BPF CI works, so we catch all of the new optimization that break existing programs in the trunk of the LLVM. Mm -hmm. And because the release cycle is like long enough, we have time to fix it either inside the LVM by introducing another undo optimization, undo pass inside BPF backend or some other trick that we do, or we just like simply improve the verifier. Because it's always, and this, the second part, when the bug fix introduced something, that yeah. so far I think like never happened. Like okay. in all of the existing releases of Clank, I don't think we like ever had the case where like, backports and fixes to like LLVM whatever 15 <clears throat> cause something something to break. And okay. we have like extensive set of programs and LLVM constantly being pushed like new changes. Okay, how often is Clang released? The major versions of Clang? More or less? Six months or so. Oh, twice per year. Okay. 
yeah, this is, is, is one year. So I think the main part that sort of save us for is that we test like nightly, nightly Clang and like anything that all the new <clears throat> optimizations, quote, quote, we catch them sooner. So once GCC gets to the stage, I think it will be similar. Whatever new optimization GCC introduces, we'll have time to react. So that's why like dedicated uh, maintenance branches sounds nice. It will probably help, but sounds like it's quite a bit of overhead will be for being utils and GCC folks to maintain. So like if you don't have to do it, then I probably wouldn't, especially considering that changes in the verifier might break existing program just as well. So it's two sides are always changing. So fixing yeah. one not necessarily will help that much. Um, so I think uh, for the for Linux in particular runtime, right, there's this feedback loop that says, well, don't make verifier changes, don't make, you know, LVM changes that, you know, break things or whatever. But for uh, other runtimes, you'd, I'm trying to answer the question, is, is it real? And I would say, yeah, the, question, the, the problem is real for other runtimes besides the Linux kernel. And to what extent you care about those gets to, as Lexi was saying, how much effort is it for you to do this, right? Because if it's very low effort, then I think it will address some problems. Is it worth it? I think you'll have to make that call. I can say that um, in, say, eBPF for Windows, this has happened both in the case where the verifier caused uh, programs to start to no longer be verified when you upgrade the verifier, as well as when you use a later version of Clang that it won't uh, be verified. So th both of those problems, the verifier problem that Lexi mentioned and the compiler problem that you're asking about, do exist, right? Is it actually worth it? That's something you have to decide, is to say, how much do you care? Well, to answer that question, I will need to know exactly, I mean, so to put it straight, I don't want people to have to, to maintain uh, forks of GCC mm -hmm. to build right. PPF programs right. now. Because it can be lots I of know, different run types. How many of them do you care about? I right. know people are doing that with Clang, and I would like to understand why. So once I understand why people are being sort of forced somehow for the circumstances, by the circumstances, to froze uh, some particular Clang version and maintain it themselves, then I then only only then I will be able to evaluate you know if this is worth or this is crazy or whatever because I still don't understand why people get forced by the circumstances to freeze clan versions and maintain them themselves. I don't know. I don't know the answer to the why question, and maybe somebody else does. But I do want to. Say, I mean, I think it seems reasonable to expect runtimes to have their own CI where they're testing nightly builds of these 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 compilers, right? I mean, it's on the it's on the runtime to yeah. To know if it's if it's being broken by a compiler, like you can't expect the compiler to be extra careful or, or have like all these extra maintenance branches for all these people. Yeah, right. And so, what happens in a particular runtime, whether you're thinking about an offload card or Windows or some user mode uh, Linux runtime or whatever, that you'd have some uh, patch request that says, "I'd like to upgrade the compiler or whatever to the latest version or whatever," and of course, that patch, the test will fail, right? And that's where you discover it says, "Well, then I'm going to be stuck on the older version," which is what Jose is asking, right? When, what's causing you to be stuck on the older version as opposed to accepting that patch to upgrade to the latest one, right? And in some cases, they can say, "Well, I want to." give pushback into you know the verifier, the compiler, whatever it is that's causing the breakage. And so, for example, in the Windows case where there was a verifier breakage, we could say, well, then let's go and fix that verifier because um, although there's multiple runtimes using the same verifier, th there's this channel to give feedback and, and things there. But for uh, Clang, there's some issues that might be more inherent, like what in, in the example that a Alan was describing earlier, right, with the correlated branches and so on, where you can't necessarily fix that easily. And so, in the, in, and so they get pinned to this older version of Clang in the meantime until there's other workarounds. And so all that is possible um, to say, I'm going to pin it to an older one or I'm going to to provide feedback, but yes, you're right. The, the runtime catches it, and it's a, when does the runtime make the choice to say, and now I'm going to upgrade to the latest one as being the default or the latest one in the CI? So I, I uh, have one use case where we've had to maintain an out of tree uh, compiler version, and that's Android. Um, we have extended release timelines, and obviously, this is a very different story, use case story than a lot of these um, upstream stories, but the big piece with Android is we ship an Android user space, and while we're, we're working to upda update kernels more often, that user space may be on a device for a year or two years or three years, however long. 
And so as we look at the BPF case for this, we have not only the Android system, we have the Android kernel, and then we have vendor partitions with vendor modules and hopefully vendor BPF here. Um, and as vendors release new BPF programs for older devices or across their ecosystem of devices that may be multiple Android versions, that is one case where it probably needs to compile with Clang for that specific system level piece. So is that a problem for you? It, it is, uh, we've run into a case where we've basically been stuck on a Clang version uh, and it prevented updates because it broke BPF compilation and we ended up having to have some out of tree patches which reverted changes in Clang and then going forward we, we implemented other workarounds. Okay. It, it got us stuck on that version. So having that experience, do you have any suggestion on how maintenance-wise or release-wise or whatever-wise, do you have any idea of how to make this better? I personally haven't thought about this case until you brought it up and as no, I'm then, But then, at, then as the I'm, problems cannot be that big. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not an easy solution or an easy problem to, to solve. Oh, well, so if you can think of something, please let us know. Absolutely. To everyone, because I'm sure the clan people probably are interested. Well, okay, so we only have five minutes more. We are on time for once. It's impressive. Um, yes. So we, we recently found a little problem, which is last week I almost had a heart attack because, uh, oh, yeah, I forgot to mention in the distros, Compiler Explorer also supports TCC BPF in different versions. So last week I almost, really almost died there because uh, Mark Poiler from the Compiler Explorer, he was like, hey, the GCC BPF, this is 14.1, it sec faults with three line BPF programs in Compiler Explorer, and he was like, oh no, don't tell me that. But no, the issue there is that they were, they were in the Compiler Explorer, they were using the C++ compiler, not the C compiler. Now, it should not ICE anyway, I mean that's some regression that we introduced recently, but the fact is that we don't support C++ and we don't support other languages than C uh, for BPF. You can use it in GCC, but now we have a little problem. So B BTF uh, implements more or less like the C type system, right? Um, but there are other languages that people use or want to use to compile to BPF like Rust, C++, please don't, <laughs> but Rust, for example. So right now, I will say that in practice, every VPF program needs BTF, right? You cannot load a BPF program in the Linux kernel without BTF. What about the Windows thing? BTF support is, part BTF is partly there, it's not complete yet. So in practice, they can't use BTF for some things, but it will be going there eventually. So in the Windows BPF engine or whatever it's called, you can load a BPF program with no BTF in it. Um, it uses BTF for like uh, line number information and source level yeah. information, that kind of, that basically that, that type of stuff. But um, it doesn't yet support um, the equivalent of kfunks, you know, where you can do a call by BTF IT. That's the part that's not there yet. That's still uh, work in progress. So. Okay. Well, but in, the, in Linux it's like that, right? I mean, you need BTF in it. So. Um, so basically this means that BTF will have to stop being only CS specific somehow. Because well, do we, like, can we just extend it to not, like, yeah, maybe not be C specific, but can we, like for Rust, I guess we need to add like a complex enum type. Like there's certain types that just aren't included, but like you can still, you can still like extrapolate that to the other types too, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I asked the Rust people last year, I think, yeah, in, I don't remember where. But they basically told me, well, when, when, when we use Rust to write some BPF program, well, of course, you have to be careful to only use the subset of uh, <laughs> yeah, the type yeah. system that actually BTF can express. And that it happens that the Clang backend or and the, or the LVM backend or the GCC backend, it happens that that's the right thing with the, the back internal debug info that it gets from the front end. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I think that sooner or later we will have to pass from it just happens to work 
into a design thing, the thing yeah. design stage, right? And another reason that we should do this at some point, maybe on the sooner side too, is if we're going to standardize BTF, we probably want it to accommodate not just C, but these other languages too, because that'll be a huge pain in the ass to do later. Okay, yeah. Um, but anyway, so this ACE, you know, it wrote this up, basically. Um, and finally, just to finish, just a very small question. Is this in the only V4? Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, thank you. Sorry? There's no V5, so it's V4 all Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me v4 I was plus, thinking yes. about the future. But it's so like in Clank, it's already in V4. Okay, we were not sure about that, so, okay. Yeah, so we first added support to the verifier for this to make sure like everything like still working and then enabled it in V4. Okay, cool, so thank you. <laughs>